There we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're just going to give a few minutes for those that didn't arrive early. <clears throat> so just please stand by. I'm going to work on some things in the background, I'm trying to make the lighting just a little bit better for us. There we go. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we are just a minute past the hour. And I honestly, I don't know. Uh, happy Thursday. Happy Thursday, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure how long this presentation will, will go for today. Uh, we've got a ton of different topics to cover. Uh, and so this one will be just a little bit different than some of our previous sessions where uh, and the the overall theme thus far has been that here we just we focus in on the basic constructs of network automation uh, but we go really deep on those constructs and i'm taking that idea and theme and i'm just throwing it away because for today we're actually going to be covering a specific use case a specific situation that everyone will find themselves in uh, very, very quickly after getting started with network automation. And that is, you've got some kind of script, right? So let's just say you have a Python script that you've been executing and you, you're ready for it to go live into production, but you don't know where to go or where to, where to look. And so today we're gonna be covering about uh, half a dozen or so different technologies uh, that will all play an important role in helping you get your production, uh, your production ready script into actual the production environment. Uh, so we will, again, we're going to be touching on a lot of different things today. Uh, however, they will be um, a little bit high level. Each one of these things honestly requires a, a dedicated session within itself. Hopefully, uh, what you'll find is that this session is still going to be extremely beneficial to help you understanding what it is that you need to get up and off the ground running. Uh, so we still have a lot of attendance uh, coming in. So I'm just going to wait, stand by for just a minute or so, and, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. And by the way, uh, while we wait for other friends to join in, if anyone's got any questions or if there's anything specifically top of mind that you'd like, uh, feel free to unmute yourself at any point. Uh, I, I'm used to being interrupted uh, quite a bit, so it's I'm completely comfortable with it. Uh, if you don't feel confident in sounding off, if you want to just use the chat, that's what it's there for as well. Hey, Calvin, this is Eric Davis. Uh, Eric. I have a quick question. I know it's not directly related to the Python part, but um, you know, last session I kind of missed and I wanted to see if I could catch up. Um, it had to do with the um, Antibol um, session. And um, I 
got I've got a working YAML file and I've got a um, a script running in Ansible, but I keep running into um, protocol. Uh, what is it? It says um, error reading SSH protocol banner. Okay, and I keep getting stuck on that. <laughs> Okay, uh, what's the what's the end device that you're talking to? Um, it's an EX forty three hundred. EX forty three hundred. Okay, uh, and uh, what? Uh, how are you? Uh, do you know off the top of your head what Ansible module you're using to call that EX switch? Yes, um, it is Junos Juniper Junos. Juniper. Oh, sorry. No, that's the role. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let me let me look at it real quick. Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Uptime. I had this working like a year ago, and then I trashed it, and I forgot all about it, and then I tried to redo it again, and I can't remember where the hell I was. When Story I was. of my life in the automated right? world. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the the. The module is Juniper underscore Junos underscore command. Okay. Okay. So uh, that module is going to allow you to run like basically like a show command on a device and get the, the data. Correct. Straight. I was trying to run show system uptime basically. Oh, okay. Understood. Very, very basic. But... Yep. And do you have like a message of the day banner or something along those lines? Um, on the device itself? Yeah, like if you SSH no. to do it, does it say, you know, welcome no. to... Welcome? No, no, I have, I have not. Okay, uh, so it definitely sounds like we have an issue either within the, either within the version of the module that you're using or in the version of the code. You should not have to worry about a banner. Um, so, um, Typically, when I see that that type of message, and the, the reason why I asked you what's the end device, is that some of the Python modules uh, within Ansible and, and some of these uh, that are just Ansible-less, they will rely on what we call screen scraping. And that is basically uh, a, a, a standard SSH connection from your uh, from your script to the remote device, and then the script will be kind of waiting, right? Or I'm sorry, the, the, the Python code will be waiting to see some banner information come back from the device, either like a message of the day banner, or in sometimes it's just looking for the command prompt, you know, like user at switch, and then um, uh, the, the less than sign or the greater than sign. And so I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm pretty surprised to hear you running into that on Juniper devices because they, especially using the official Juniper modules uh, like you are, because that should not be a situation that you run into. Um, let's do this. It, it, if you're available, um, let's see. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if we can either uh, have a dedicated session, just you and I to, to kind of work through it or but I'm like also in the same mind realizing that I'm on PTO next week and I'm trying my best not to do work in my time. No, it's off. okay. I, I, I actually am on PTO starting Tuesday through Friday. So, okay. Well, um, if, if, if you wouldn't mind just uh, shooting me an email and uh, we'll, we'll set up a working session between us and we'll perfect. get cashed out. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to like take up the time here, but I just wanted to give you a, a heads up that I was. I appreciate it. Really do, really appreciate it. Um, all right, so we got a full house. Um, let's go ahead and transition into the overarching theme uh, of today's presentation. That is, uh, what should we consider when we're trying to take our automation into production? And so I've broken this up into five different categorizations. One is the, the management of your script over its life cycle. That's creating a project, that's updating code, uh, that's you know, deleting the project whenever the script has been retired or archiving it. How do we do that? What kind of services are available for us? Um, and then I wanna to touch on a second point that I think is incredibly important, especially in, when you're working within a team construct with an automation and that's how can we work together on the same script without causing conflicts, without overriding each other's 
uh, efforts or uh, just creating some kind of clashing. And so we're, we'll talk a little bit about, actually we'll spend probably a good amount of time about how these different services like GitHub and GitLab really facilitate a collaborative uh, working environment for building automation. Uh, then we'll touch upon some of the problems that people find themselves within this um, this uh, this problem is is um, ref commonly referred to as well it works on my machine type of issue right where the environment of your Python script um, on your local workstation will look very different across everyone else's workstation or any server that you're executing on. So how can tools like Docker and Python virtual environments really help us have a consistent uh, delivery for our automation? Uh, also, just really quick, we'll touch upon some additional tools that will also help kind of make your life a little bit easier when you're working within an automation project. And finally, we'll touch a little bit on CICD. Uh, I, <laughs> I specifically led like a clickbait uh, thing. Does it really fit for network automation? Well, uh, we'll we'll touch upon that. There's a lot of misconceptions around what CICD is, and we're hoping to kind of clarify because there is a fit here for automation, but it's a very specific fit that might not really align with the goals that you're looking for. So uh, this is the agenda that we have set out for us. Now, Again, here we are, we've got a Python script, we've tested it on our computer about 20 times, we feel extremely confident that uh, it's going to work exactly as we expect it to. So the question remains, are there any services available that will help us manage this script through its lifetime? Um, that's again, the, the creation of projects, the collaborative efforts, all those really great features that we need to make sure that we have a full history of this script over its life. And so I'm gonna be focusing this part of the conversation around two of the most prominent uh, services that are available for us. Um, and those are GitHub and GitLab. Now in today's presentation, I'll be using GitHub, but I just want you to, to at least have this understanding before we go into this, that the two are competing solutions. They technically provide a very similar uh, look and feel, a very similar functionality uh, for us. And that is we create our automation projects as what we would call repositories. Uh, and then kind of like in Junos, the way that we enter on a Juniper device, the way that we enter the configuration mode, we enter this construct of this candidate configuration that allows us to stage any changes that we wanna make onto the device. And then there's a commit operation that goes through where we would see kind of like the before and after, and we can give the thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not we wanna push through with our commit. Well, similar to that type of mentality, in GitHub and in GitLab, we have this, this construct of a branch. And this is primarily the, the place that we will be doing all of our work, just like the candidate config. Think of it in, in this way, if I, if I can draw some parallels here, you're running configuration on a network device. That is the production config. That's what the device is running. But when you want to make changes, you, you go into edit mode and then you start making all those changes to the candidate config. That's exactly how we do things in, or the best practice to do things in GitHub and GitLab, where we have a, a production version of the code and nobody touches it just as it is. What we do instead is we will create a branch of that production code, which is more like a, a, let's just say it's a, it's a safe space, right? It's a sandbox for us to make proposals, uh, to make modifications. And then before we actually merge it into the main production version of the branch, or the main production version of the um, branch of the project, then we'll have teammates collaborate on it. We'll, we'll ask others for review. They'll be able to see the diff and then we'll actually merge it into the main branch. We'll see a lot of this today. Um, and so this will, again, this allows us to work within this, this kind of safe space without touching the production code, 
Uh, it'll allow us to, to you know, refactor our automation or uh, enhance it with new features. Now, this pull request, you'll hear pull request. Um, pull request, I believe, is entirely specific to GitHub and other services that I've used, like my personal preferences, GitLab. Again, don't worry about them. I, I highly recommend starting with GitHub because it's, it's fantastic. Um, but in GitLab and other services, we'll call them merge requests. So if you hear pull request and merge request, it, we're really saying the same thing. And that is, again, that process that it gives us uh, to review any kind of proposed changes that are made into an environment. But this is going to be our, our jump off point here for our automation. Actually, I think I have, no, I don't. I don't have another slide just yet. Let's go ahead and <clears throat> walk through the instantiation of a GitHub uh, profile, and then we'll start to figure out how we can take our code, our Python script, and move it into our production environment. So with that being said, I'm gonna open the wrong window. Let's start with this one here. That one's good. Okay, so I've got a brand new shiny email address. It's called Juniper Automation. Oops, I'm sorry, I do not have an existing account. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one so that we can see the entire process from front to start. And I'm gonna turn off my dark mode just in case it's there. We'll go and we'll create a new account. Now, I, I, I wanted to stage this ahead of time, but honestly, the GitHub registration is so cool. I think everyone should be able to experience it. Just uh, So let's go ahead and start with my email address of juniperautomation at protonmail.com. And we'll say yes. And I'm gonna create a very secret password here. And they tell me that the password is strong. My username is going to be, well, we'll just call it juniper-automation. There we are. And do I want to receive any marketing information? I do not. So we'll just go ahead and type the letter in. Uh, and OK, so I need to start a puzzle. So we'll just do this together. Uh, pick the spiral galaxy. That's going to be this one. And this one's going to be this one. OK. All right, so we should now have our GitHub profile account. Oops, I need to do a little verification. So let's go ahead and log in. Now, the thing to remember with a uh, with uh, GitHub is this authentication piece. Now, let's go ahead and, and just take care of this real quick. 429-396, 429-396. And there we go. Uh, we're going to say, it's just me. I'm a student. Please. Thank you. And I'm going to skip all of these goodies that we have right here. All right. And that's fine. They're, they're trying to customize the environment for me, but um, we don't need any of that. So here we are. Uh, we've created a new GitHub account. Now, what's interesting to note is that GitHub used to be exclusively a SaaS-based solution. Uh, and this was one of the differentiations between GitHub and GitLab. Uh, but honestly, today, where we are is both GitHub and GitLab can be run on-prem or they can be ran as a SaaS-based solution. In this case, uh, we're going to be using the traditional GitHub SaaS solution. That point, though, that on-prem, off-prem point is going to going to significantly affect how relevant CICD is for us later. Just thinking of just we'll, we'll get to that point in just a second uh so now okay so we again we have a python script let me go ahead and pull that up so that we can take a peek at what we're working with here i'm going to log into visual studio code this is the text editor that i use for all of my automation development if you haven't seen me use this before i highly recommend checking this out this is probably one of Microsoft's greatest products that they've ever made. Let's go ahead and, uh, well, let me see if I can reestablish my SSH connection. I'm on the wrong network. And if I drop off, hmm, this is going to be a problem. Um, let me see if I can't do something really quick. I'm going to grab a script from a server. I happen to be on the wrong. DMZ inside of my house. So let's, let's 
try to um, stand by this will just take a second. And that is a slash 16. Now I'm going to go to 41. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm using a, a back, a back door and to get into my coding server. Let's see, development, this one, we'll do networking and automation examples, Python, and my first Python program. Okay, I'm gonna clear the screen and then I'm gonna cat out my app.py. And this is going to be the Python script that we're working with today. Now, it might not look like anything just yet. Let's go ahead and make sure we got all of it. And I'm gonna copy and paste it into my text editor. Now, this is all gonna be available. Um, it's already available on my, on my personal GitLab. Uh, so don't worry if you um, don't understand what you're seeing here. I try to do my best to uh, fully document what everything is doing. But at the end of the day, what this Python script is enabling me to do is to, uh, to reach out to a pair of virtual firewalls and download their configuration. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm going to need to, uh, to be on the same local LAN. Let me, let me try to not disrupt the Zoom session, but I, I definitely can't deal with the, being in the wrong DMZ, so please stand by. Okay, I'm gonna pretend like everyone can still hear me. If you cannot, please sound off. I won't be able to hear you very well. Let's go ahead and connect to host. Okay, oh, okay, you can, great. Thanks, Jason, thanks, Eric. Uh, appreciate that small hiccup there. I created a dedicated DMZ, dedicated VRF for all my smart home devices, because I have some paranoia about Apple and Google and them listening in on me. Um, and unfortunately my computer joined that network and could not access the rest of my environment. So uh, let's go ahead and open up my automation example for Python, my first Python project. Okay. All right. And I'm just gonna open up my script here as soon as my page loads. But again, the idea behind this script is that it's going to Let's say copy and let's create a new page here. Uh, this script is gonna have the power to reach into any Juniper device and download its configuration and store a local copy. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. So as soon as I get some access here, our very first thing to do is to create a project to hold this inside of GitHub. So I'm just gonna paste it into my text editor for now. And in the background, we're gonna create a new repository. I'm gonna call this repository, my first Python project. Now, I obviously uh, would appreciate if you had the capability of giving it a little bit more descriptive name, uh, but for us, our use cases, this will be just fine. Now, when we create this project or this repository in GitHub, we're gonna have a couple of different options for us before we go ahead and instantiate it. One is to add a description. And so we'll just say Python script to download uh, Juniper device configurations. All right. Uh, the next important, really important decision, do we want to make this publicly available for everybody or do you want to make this a private repository? Now, back there was a time before Microsoft acquired GitHub where the private repositories, a free user could have one. And honestly, what I did is I just took one repository and I stuffed all my projects in there. And that's how I kind of got around not having to pay. Uh, but honestly, uh, Microsoft has, has done a phenomenal uh, job of managing the GitHub uh, products since they acquired it a couple of years back. And one of the things they changed is the licensing and the user uh, subscription. So now everyone gets unlimited amount of public or private uh, repositories. 
Now, there's another couple of things that uh, I always check when I build my projects up, and that is we're going to add a README file, which is think of it as kind of like a landing page, a landing document for people to read whenever they browse to your repository. Here you can add basic information about what your project is, what are the dependencies of your project, um, how does it execute, examples, documentation, et cetera. So adding a readme file right out of the gate is a really good start. Also, there's this construct of a, of a git ignore. And what that is, is it is a, a plain text file that allows you to declare which folders and which files to not include in your, um, your backing up in, uh, to, to GitHub. So this will be really important when we talk about managing secret files. Um, I don't want my secret files to be stored on uh, anywhere anybody else can see it. So that would be an example of, of one of the files that I would include in a git ignore. We'll definitely take a peek at that later. But uh, there, GitHub also provides a lot of templates for these git ignores. So I'm going to go ahead and drop down the menu and I'm going to say I'm coding this project in Python. And what the GitHub will do is it will, when it creates this git ignore file, it will automatically include all the, uh, I don't wanna say annoying, but all the unimportant files that might come up in a Python project. Uh, so like Python cache files and other types of things, uh, this git ignore file will automatically exclude them from the conversation. And choose a license. This is important if you're doing a public repository like we are. Uh, I am not a licensing expert. I'm not a legal expert. I just typically go with Apache 2, honestly, because that's what I've been told to do. So if, if uh, don't take my advice on this, if you're interested in learning about which license is appropriate, from what I understand, Apache 2 and MIT license are typically the most uh, flexible and non-restrictive, uh, but Honestly, if you're if you're putting in a, a project, um, I would consult with the team, can maybe even consult legal if you're going to make it public as to what kind of license is appropriate for your organization. And I'm going to click this uh, green create repository. Now, what this is going to do is it created those three files that we talked about: uh, the README, the license, and the git ignore. And we see that stored as a, the in the path of my username, Juniper Automation and the name of my project or my repository is my first Python project. Now, I, I want to pivot real, just for a second, really quick, and talk about how, before we, we actually pull this down to our computer, what this whole um, Git branches and, and pull request and what that actually looks like. So let's go ahead and give an example. I have these three files and one of these files is my readme file. Like I mentioned earlier, this is my landing page for any kind of documentation or such. When I open this up, I have the opportunity of making changes. But like I said, just like with our candidate or with our running configuration, we don't on Juniper devices, we don't just log in and start making changes to the to the production config. We we actually will have a candidate config checked out for us where we'll do all our, our changes in a safe space and then we'll commit them into the production. So rather than me making changes to this readme file right now, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna create a branch. This will be a dedicated place for me to make any kind of modifications and then we'll review those changes before we actually commit them into the production. So from here at, on, the, on the branch menu, you can see the default is main. And others, the default is the name, uh, the word master. Don't worry about it. Uh, just know going forward, everyone's pretty much going to be using main as the uh, primary production branch for code. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, let's go ahead and type in a branch here. I'm going to call this branch readme update. It doesn't have to really pertain to what you're doing. I could have called this vanilla ice cream cone. It would have been just fine. Uh, but typically, especially when you work in a team construct, if you can give pretty descriptive branches, uh, pretty descriptive names for your branches, then everyone else, when they pull down those branches, they'll understand what it is that they're looking at. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this create branch, read me update. And what I get from there is uh, the top banner will tell me that we have now created a branch. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and start making the changes to our README file here. And this is just a standard text document. It's written in Markdown language, MD, if you haven't ever seen it before. Highly recommend it. It's just a much easier way of writing text. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to uh, change the title of this README to say uh, Juno's configuration backup tool. Right, and this will say that that description is pretty good. Now, anytime I want to make changes inside of and, and submit my changes into GitHub, I need to add a message. And this is a really great opportunity for you to do your due diligence to document what it is that you're changing in the code. So in this case, I'm going to say um, we updated the title within our readme file. And I'm going to, this time, I'm going to go ahead and select commit changes. Now, this will actually commit my changes, but only to the branch that's titled readme-update. If we switch back over to main, we'll see that my readme file, it's currently sitting as what we expect for our production, which was my first Python project. But now I've got two separate instances of this file. Uh, it with and they're completely namespaced off from each other. Now, let's say I wanted to take my changes that I just made to the readme and I want to add it back into the main line or the main branch of the code. What I would need to do is I would fill out this process called a pull request. And so within a pull request, let's go ahead and move into this uh, section right here called pull request. And it GitHub will tell me, it said, readme update has recent pushes and then how many minutes ago so what we'll do is we'll do a compare and pull request very similar to a show show compare on a juniper device and here we can see yes uh this message that we added we feel like it's a, a good message but what's important is that we can see a a diff between what was uh committed on or where it was before is highlighted here in red and what our can what our proposed changes are going to be are listed here in green. I'm going to go ahead and select this create pull request because that looks good to me. And then uh, we will at that point have the option of performing a merge on this pull request. When I do this, we should be we should be given the option to delete that readme branch that we had created earlier. Let me see confirm merge here. And it says pull request successfully merged and closed. Now they're giving me an option to delete that readme update branch. Uh, we'll go ahead and make that so, and we'll delete that branch. Now when I return back to my Python project and I'm looking at the main, the main branch, the production branch, I can see that that readme has been updated. So that's this construct around uh, GitHub's pull request mechanism and a little insight into branching. This is honestly a really, really deep conversation to have around Git, uh, probably warrants two hours within itself, but I just wanted you to at least see that workflow before we get started. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to pull this project repository down to our machine then we're going to add our Python code to it, and then we're going to push it back up. And again, I don't want to do this in the main branch. So let's do this. Let's create a new branch here. And I'm going to call this one add Python script. All right. And we'll go ahead and do that. Now, if it helps you represent or if it helps you visualize, let me see. I, I'm, I know I've got a slide around here. Um, this is exactly what we're showcasing here. We start with this main branch, or sometimes it's also called master, but then we create a dedicated, isolated environment, a clone of that as a new branch. Now, this is where we perform all of our proposed changes to it, and then we submit the pull request like we just saw. This gives us an opportunity to bring in other teammates to review our proposed changes for them to sign off on it or for them to make recommendations. We make those modifications as we see fit. And when everyone gives the green light and thumbs up, then what we'll do is we'll, we'll go ahead and perform the pull request, which will then take that additional uh, change and merge it back into the production code. 
So uh, this is a slide that I thought I had. <laughs> it was just in a different section here. Uh, when you open a pull request, you're proposing changes to the code, allowing someone to review it, and again, giving the thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, and then just like on the Junos devices, you can do a, or the, the pull request is gonna show you a diff between what you had before and what you are proposing. So with that being said, let's return to our browser and now that we've got our own dedicated branch to do our to add our Python file, let's go ahead and figure out how to download this project to our computer. The quickest way of doing things, uh, let's see, we got a good question here. How does the workflow happen in parallel? Our uh, people are working on features. Uh, how do we make sure that the changes are always in sync? So a great question, right? We run into the same problem on on juniper devices like if there's two people sshed into the box and they're both inside of the config mode how does the how does the box know which one of the devices or which one of the configs to actually accept and in many cases and this is a, a default within automation as well uh, the they they will enter a configuration exclusive mode on the network device and that's kind of how we handle these conflicts now, in, in contrast, in this software world where we're, we're writing automation, we're writing code, it's very likely that as I'm working on a file, you're also working on a file. And we might be working on that same file in different branches. However, as long as there's no conflict, when I merge my code or I propose my merge back into the master branch, as long as there's no conflict with that branch right there, my code will be able to successfully merge. And honestly, if, if we were all just working from the main branch and we weren't using branches, you can, you can absolutely do that. It gets messy and it creates situations like the one that you're talking about. Uh, but Git, the Git protocol itself that we'll look at in just a second, has the capability of identifying conflicts and will will actually prompt the user to say, listen, you're you're proposing this change to this file in this specific section, and you have another teammate over here that's proposed this change in the in the same file at the same exact um, at the same exact position within the code. And so one of you is going to have to uh, perform this resolution within Git. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, honestly, if you're if you are interested in learning a little bit more, please let me know, and then we'll we'll do a dedicated session just on Git and GitHub and how to how to work them with in this context. Um, but I'm I'm trying to be cognizant that we do have uh, a limited time, but really good question because it's definitely a situation that you will run into. Okay, so here we are. We can see that we have two branches. Uh, one is the main branch where we do not make changes to, and then the other one is the add Python script. Now, the very quick way of downloading this is I could just click the green button and say download the zip file. This, um, this will work, but this is not the droids that you're looking for. What you want to use instead is one of these three options that they have under this word clone. Now, clone is a operation in Git that that represents you cloning a project from a remote source. It's a one-time operation for every project. So we can see that we can, we can perform the git clone over HTTPS. Uh, we can use SSH keys and download it over SSH. I know all of us network engineers just love that idea. Uh, there's also a GitHub CLI tool for, uh, I think, almost all the operating systems. I, I'm pretty sure even Microsoft has got their own. They should considering that they own GitHub now. But in our case, I'm not gonna mess with SSH keys, although that is my preferred way of doing it because I hate typing in passwords. For this case, I'm gonna go ahead and use a HTTPS. So what I need to do is I just need to go ahead and click this little uh, clipboard here. It tells me that I've copied the, the path. So let's go back to our terminal and let me see, clear the screen, please. Oh, I lost my connection whenever I changed my Wi-Fi. So let me move back into my server. There we go. And I'm just going to create a new project. Actually, let's go ahead and, and pull it down right here. So to use, to interface with GitHub, to interface with GitLab, uh, we use a protocol. It's an application protocol called Git. Now, this was written by 
the same man that created Linux. He's uh, arguably which one's better, I don't know, but but Linus, the guy that created Linux, also created Git, and it's now kind of the de facto way of interacting with uh, services like GitHub and GitLab. So again, I need to do a one-time operation of pulling down the repositories code to my local workstation. So for that, I do a git clone, and then I paste in the name or I paste in the path for the URL. Uh, and then it go, went ahead and allowed me to do it. And so we'll do LL, and then I'm gonna change into my directory, my first Python project. We'll go ahead and clear that screen up here. And if I look into this directory, I can see that I've got two files, right? But it's actually three. There's actually a hidden file in here. So ls-lsa. I can see that I also have a git ignore file. This was automatically created for us when we selected Python as our language when we created this repository. Um, and there's our readme. And if we open up the readme, what we should expect to see is the uh, Juniper configuration backup tool, which is exactly what we see. All right, so let me also type in git branch. Now this tells me that there's only one branch on my computer should be able to do a fetch operation. Let's see, git branch. Uh, it looks like we still only have the main. So let's go ahead and create our own uh, branch here. That's going to be git uh, checkout branch. And we're going to call this uh, add Python scripts. We'll go ahead and do that. And what it's done right now is it's gone ahead and it switched me to a new branch on my computer called add Python scripts. So this command get checkout dash B, uh, get checkout branch, and then the name of my branch will allow me to create that, that safe space sandbox like you saw us do on the GitHub website. Now for us, I'm gonna go ahead and copy that Python script that I was showcasing earlier. Calvin R, and we're gonna say this is networking. These are automation examples, Python, and we're going to select uh, my first Python app, app.py, and into my local directory. All right, so here we are. We now have a Python file, app.py. We just take a peek at that again. This looks like the Python file that I was expecting to have. Let me go ahead and um, Let's see, the best thing for me to do now is, uh, is to help others with managing packages, all right? So before, actually, before we get to that, let me go ahead and add this file and push it up into GitHub. So the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna type in git add, and then I'm gonna point to the name of my file. In this case, it's app. That will then tell the, the git on my computer to look for this app file and add it into the, the, the perspective of the project. If you did not add it, git will not be looking for that file. So we added it to the, to the, to the world of git. And now I'm gonna do add a message. Now, like I said before, there is a requirement for you to add a message whenever you perform a, a commit operation. Commit is a way of saying, hey, we've made some changes. I'm gonna commit those changes right now. And that's the second to last step before we actually do the push, which will push it to the production branch. But if I uh, hit this right now, git commit, it will tell me, hey, look, um, you were supposed to add a message, but you did not. And so it'll put you in a text editor to force you to add a message. I'm gonna exit out of there and I'm just gonna pass it as a, as a flag here. I'm gonna say git commit dash M for my commit message. I'm gonna say add our Python script and then close that. And so now we've committed our changes to be pushed back up to the GitHub repository. We haven't performed that push. We've only committed those changes. And that's an important distinction to understand because if, if we visited GitHub right now, we'll go ahead and do that. If I refresh my page, I will not see a, 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 an app.py file. We have not pushed it back up. So let's go ahead and try a git push. And then it'll tell us this is a, a one-time uh, situation. The problem here is that we created a branch locally on our computer, but we haven't told GitHub about how to, um, to uh, we haven't told GitHub anything about that branch. 
So let me go ahead and copy the example that they have for us. And I'm gonna paste it. We're basically telling uh, GitHub, hey, look, we're working inside of a branch and we wanna push this code that we just added into that branch up on GitHub. GitHub says, fine, but who are you? So in this case, I'm gonna say Juniper Automation and I hope, I don't think that needs an email and my super secret password here. And it says, uh, oh, support for password authentication was revoked two weeks ago. Okay, it looks like we're gonna be using SSH keys after all. Uh, so a really important thing that we learned today is that HTTPS is no longer allowed for you to use uh, password authentication with GitHub. This, uh, this was not a thing for me because I still work inside of GitLab. So in my case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my public SSH key. And I'm gonna try to do this secretly where you guys can't see what's going on because if you had access to my Git, uh, my SSH keys, I'd be in a lot of trouble. So in order for me to add my machine's SSH key, what I'm gonna do is on my profile in GitHub, I'm gonna go down to the settings panel and I'm going to look for SSH keys right here. There we go. Before I do that, let me see if I can turn off the dark profile. I think that's pretty difficult for everyone to read. I apologize for that appearance. And let's go to day theme, please. Please activate. Uh, let's do single theme. Uh, there we go. Okay, hopefully that's easier for everyone to read. I'm gonna go down into this SSH keys. Now I need to add my systems uh, key so that it understands exactly who I am. Now on here, this should be my, this will be my private key. Now, if, if you uh, don't play in this space very often, you don't work with SSH keys, just understand that when you create an SSH key on your computer, you are actually creating a pair, a public key, which can be shared with everybody because it doesn't really, it's only a mechanism to help unlock, but what you really need in the background is your private key. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this enter key and look at my public key here. And I think that's what it's looking for. Let me go ahead and paste it here and say, add SSH key. Uh, it says the key is already in use. So the key is in use on my personal GitHub profile and that's gonna be a problem for them because it doesn't show any kind of uniqueness. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new SSH key. So SSH key gen, uh, we're gonna say it's gonna be RSA. The bit is gonna be 4096. And I'm gonna add a comment and we're gonna say automation monthly. And I think I spelled that right. Let's go ahead and do that. It's gonna ask me where I wanna put this key. I'm gonna say home, my username, SSH, and then automation will be there. Uh, I do not want to password protect my uh, SSH key. And well, there we go. Now, if I open up that SSH key, let's say um, uh, automation.pub, there we are. And here we see our, this is the public version of my key. I'm gonna go ahead and add that here and click add SSH key. And so now it recognizes that key as associating to my username. So anytime I want to authenticate with GitHub for like a push operation or it's uh, anything else, it will now understand, yes, that is actually Calvin. Okay, uh, so with that being said, let me see if we can, uh, let's, did I lose it? I'm losing my computer here. There we go. Let's go ahead and see if I can't authenticate with us to uh, so SHT get at github.com and then I SSH automation. Let's see, okay. So what I just did is I did a test. So SSH T get at github.com and then I passed in the path of my, uh, my SSH key. All right. Unfortunately for my situation, when I first cloned my project, I did it over HTTPS and now I'm gonna be trying to authenticate over um, through um, SSH. So I need to make some modifications to my git. Let's do git slash config. And I just need to change this transport right here to be, uh, let's see, I forgot what it is. Uh, let's come back over to my project. 
we got hitting backspace. There we go. All right. And let me refresh the page, get that white theme. And so this is going to be, I think that's right. That should be right. Let me go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and exit out. I'm going to go ahead and, and check a different project just to make sure that we're not doing anything incorrect here. Networking, uh, automation, automation examples, Python, and we'll pick this one and we'll say dot git config. Okay, it's the URL is, yeah, it's git at GitLab. Okay, so let me go ahead and, and edit my uh, directory git git config and we'll go ahead and pass this in here Let's say url is this enter and then that okay now if i do a git pull let me see okay and now if i do a git push let's see if i can do this i've never used git push to the uh, repository so let me final thing i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, move into my SSH directory and, uh, oops, uh, SSH, clear the screen. I'm going to move my primary uh, public and private keys to a, a new directory var temp. And let's see, var temp. And then I'm going to rename my automation uh, dot pub to ID rsa.pub and so I I don't expect you to ever run into this situation. I just have a conflict within my SSH keys and I don't really feel like spending the right now working through that. So let's do git push and git push, there we go. Okay, so what we've done <laughs> in a very long method of doing it is we first tried to authenticate with HTTPS uh, it seemed as though a week ago or two weeks ago, GitHub removed the ability to authenticate with username and password. But so, and that was a problem because when we were trying to push our changes up into GitHub, uh, GitHub was saying, okay, you want to make some changes? Well, who are you? And so I entered my username and password and said, hey, we don't allow that anymore. So we defaulted back to SSH. Now, in my situation, I had SSH keys already on my computer associated to a different account. So I had to create new SSH keys and then rename my primary keys into the ones that we created. Hope you never run into that situation. But if you do, you'll now have this video to, to revisit about that. All right. So if I go back up to GitHub now, I get a message on my repository and it says, add Python scripts had recent pushes less than a minute ago. Now you'll notice again here, uh, working from my main branch, that I do not have in my app.py, which is my Python script. Um, so, but it is available in this add Python scripts branch here. Now, let me go ahead and see here, like I told you earlier, there will be a diff presented to you, green and red. In this case, we see everything is green because we're adding a new file. And so, I'm going to go ahead and leave a comment and it says uh, looks good to me and go ahead and create that pull request. And uh, this is an opportunity for CICD to kick in whenever they detect that type of change and perform a bunch of auditing and actions on your script. In my case, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, select the confirm merge request uh, and this is or the pull request and it's going to take my app.py and move it into my primary branch on my project. So we come back over here to code. We can see that we've got app.py. When we look into it, we can see, yep, that looks like my Python script. Looks good to us. All right. Um, now I've got a little problem here in that I created a couple of branches and I kind of got a little bloat. So let me see if I can't go ahead and delete some of those branches. I only want to be uh, basing my work off of the main branch here. So I'll go ahead and delete those two and come back over to here. We should just have one branch that we're working for. Now on my computer, my computer doesn't know that I just deleted those branches from GitHub. So I can do two things. I can do a pull operation, 
which will pull down any changes that have been made on the remote side to my local computer. And once I can see, okay, there's been some changes into the main branch, let me go ahead and check out now the main branch. That's gonna switch me over into the main. And it can tell, it tells me right off the bat, it says, hey, look, you're in the main branch, but you haven't pulled down all the changes to main branch. You're two commits behind. So we'll go ahead and do an LL just to validate, no app.py. But now I wanna pull down those changes from GitHub. So I do a git pull and that's gonna pull down my app.py. And it tells me which files it pulled down and which changes to those files were made. In this case, we uh, have all greens, meaning that everything was net new inside of this script. And if we run LL again, we can see that we have app.py. Okay, so here I am. Now, the problem is that I've downloaded this repository, has app.py, and it's supposed to be automating my Juno's uh, configuration downloads. But if I ran this right now, Python app.py, I'm gonna get some invalid issue or I'm gonna get some problems presented to me. In this case, it says you've got some invalid syntax. Well, the problem that I've got right now is that I'm working within the default Python environment. And I can validate that just by typing the name or the word which, and then whatever it is that I'm looking for. In this case, uh, I'm saying which Python, and the system returns back to me which version of Python or which path for that Python file, it will default to. So in this case, it's user bin Python, which I just happen to know is my system's default settings. The problem here is that it doesn't have all those great Python packages that I needed to be able to perform automation against my devices. So I'm going to transition back to the PowerPoint for a second to bring us into the next section here. And that is, how can we help maintain a consistent Python environment? If someone just downloaded my app.py and ran it, it's not gonna work because they don't have all those dependencies that I was expecting to have on my computer. So there's a couple of different paths that we can go down. One is using this construct of a Python virtual environment. And that's gonna be, I'm gonna be using a tool called Poetry that helps me do this. Now what Poetry will do is it will create a dedicated place for all of your projects, Python repository, or all of its packages and dependencies and such. And so the workflow in using poetry is you, you type in git, or I'm sorry, you type in poetry and knit, and that will walk you through an interactive way of saying which Python packages that you would like this, pro this project to use. And when you get through that little wizard, the end result is it'll present you with a couple of files that will say exactly which Python project or which Python uh, dependencies are required for this project. And then you can use those two files that were generated to then download and install them. The value here is that one, you get a dedicated, isolated Python environment just for your project. But probably more important, those two files that were produced from the poetry init, those can now be included into my Git repository. And now anyone else that downloads my project will know exactly how to install my Python project, uh, uh, my Python dependencies. And not just that, it'll be the specific version that we're using. So this gets away from the, the classic problem of, hey, it works on my machine. I don't know why it doesn't work on yours. This way we have exactly the exact Python environment that's now being able to be replicated across Windows, Mac, and Linux on any kind of environment. So let's go ahead and walk through this process right here. I'm gonna come back to my terminal and I'm gonna create a new poetry environment here. So let's clear the screen. I'm gonna say poetry init. Now I said, you, this is gonna walk you through an interactive install for, or interactive wizard for you to create these, these text files for you. So the first one, it's gonna default the package name to your project, I'm okay with that. It's gonna ask you which version, this can be version controlled, I'm gonna just leave it at its default. Description, I'm gonna say um, Juno's configuration backup tool. And the author is gonna default to whatever is in your git config files, in this case, it's my name and my email address. And my license here is Apache 2.0. 
and compatible Python versions. So you're not only depending, you're not only pinning the specific Python package versions, you're also pinning a specific Python version. So in my case, I'll say anything that's Python 3.8 and later will work for us. So we'll say yes. Now here's the part where they'll ask us to type in the names of our Python projects or Python packages that we wanna use. The very first one that I wanna use is going to enable me to build uh, API connections uh, to my Juniper devices. So I'm going to say Junos Easy NC, and that's going to be uh, that represents the Pi Easy project. Now you can see we get a list of ten different items that come back to us. This is more like a search function, and they're just saying, "Hey, we think you mean Junos Easy NC, but in case you didn't, here's some others that we think are kind of in line with what you're looking for." In my case, I'm gonna say, yes, I was looking for Junos Easy and C. So I'm gonna press the number zero. And it'll ask us if we want a very specific version of this uh, package. I typically just hit enter, just let it pick the latest. Now it's gonna ask us, would you like to add some more? And I'll say, yes, I will. I'm gonna add JXML Ease. This, uh, this is an easier way of using XML within Juniper. I'm gonna go ahead and select zero again. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and say, keep the latest. Uh, so we're good there. And I'm just going to keep hitting enter until it's done. And this is what they have generated for us, this specific file right here. This lists the Python version and the two packages that I'm looking to install here. So we'll say, yes, that looks good to me. And all it did, I'll type in LL here. All it did is it created this project uh, pyproject.toml file and a another hidden file uh, called, uh, oh, it didn't do the lock yet uh, because we haven't actually kicked off the install. Uh, so if we look into the Py project, it's going to look exactly like it does up, up on our screen here, um, just stating again what kind of dependencies we're expecting. Now, if I want to go through with the download and then in the installation of these packages into my new virtual environment, I'm going to say poetry install. That's going to look at that TOML file that we just took a peek at, and it's going to say, okay, in order for you to install Pi Easy, you need to install these dependencies. And as you can see, these dependencies get automatically mapped out, and, and poetry will go ahead and download those for you. Uh, now, for me to enter into my new Python virtual environment, I'm going to say poetry shell. Now, when I do that, it's going to automatically create a dedicated virtual environment, and it's going to put me inside of that virtual environment. And I can validate that if I type in the command pip freeze to look at which Python packages I have installed in my current environment, what I will see is things like Junos Easy and C. JXML ease and all those other dependencies. I didn't have to install these manually myself. Poetry already took care of that. And again, the power here is that it created that TOML file, which everybody now can now download and automatically recreate my environment. Now, I just happen to have a couple of additional packages that I need to have installed for us to be successful. So one of those is going to be called uh, python.env, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. But for now, I'm going to add a new package into my virtual environment. So for me to do that from the command line, rather than going through that initial wizard and running through it again, I'm already in the environment. So we'll just say poetry add, and say python.env. I believe that's the correct one. And not only will it pull down the appropriate uh, Python package, it also updates the, uh, the, the TOML file. So anything that I add later on will automatically be included into this, uh, uh, this TOML file, which will allow us to, again, make sure that we have perfect consistency. There's one other thing that I want to add. And so we'll just go ahead and say poetry add invoke. And we'll talk about invoke in just a little bit. But again, I'm just going to go ahead and add it to my repository. Now, if I try to execute my Python script, we'll say Python app.py, it's going to say, please enter your device's host name or IP address. Now, here would be a great point for me to just go ahead and um, type in either a host name or an IP. But I also, inside of my Python script, I enabled a user 
to pass in a host from the command line. So in my case, I'm gonna say the host will be virtual SRX1. And it tells me that I have some authentication issues. And let's go ahead and pull out our, our Python investigation to say, sure enough, this is the issue. The username and password are supposed to come from my environment, but I, I do not have an environmental file named username or password. This is where that Python package that we just installed called python-env really comes into play for us. It allows us to create a, an, a, an environment file that will host secret information like my username and password, uh, but uh, and, and that will be imported into my script rather than me hard coding my username and password. This enables a type of workflow to where everyone on the team has a, uh, an environment file on, inside of their local workstation and it is automatically, it gets excluded from, uh, from GitHub uh, entirely. So we'll have to make sure that that part's working as well. So let me go ahead and create that inventory file right now. I'm gonna say touch int.env, which is the specific file that the in, uh, environment file is supposed to be. And we'll go ahead and edit that right now. And I'm gonna just pass in here, uh, username equals, and we'll say root, and my password equals juniper123, all right? Should be good to go. Now let's go ahead and try to run this again. And what we get back now, instead of an authentication error, is it tells us that we have successfully downloaded the configuration for this virtual firewall and it automatically put it in its own directory. So if I clear the screen here, let's just go ahead and do a tree. Let's take a peek at our new uh, uh, structure of our Python project. We have the app.py, that's the thing that's actually running out, grabbing the config and downloading it. Uh, and then any kind of update or any configuration is automatically put into its own respective backups folder. And, this, and it'll be sorted by host name. Uh, and then time stamped with the, the day of the year and the time. So that's the, the functionality of my Python script. If we did that same script, in this case for virtual SRX2, it's going to download it and put it in its own new directory. And you can see it's time stamped and such. And if I wanted to get fancy, I could just do a diff between the backups. We'll compare virtual firewall one uh, with the config that we downloaded for virtual firewall two. Uh, and here we get a, a, a typical Linux diff. This is uh, what's changed in between the two. We can see that the two have different host names, uh, different uh, IP addresses. They have an IPsec VPN tunnel up against each other, so they're sharing different routes. Um, but anyway, so we know that we've got those two configuration files. Let me open up this tree again. All right, so now this is the look of our directory. Now think about this. How do I get these files and these directories now pushed back up into my, uh, my, my production uh, main branch? Let's first check out which, which branch that we're working on. So get branch. I can see that I'm on the main branch um, and I don't wanna make those changes here. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll just go ahead and create a new branch. I'll say get checkout branch and then we'll we'll say this is going to be um, add add dash backups and let's go ahead and do an ll again so although i just created a a new branch um, again all of my files are still there uh, for now what we need to do is we need to add all those new files and check them in to get now I don't, uh, in order to do this, we do the git add operation, but I don't wanna add every single file individually. Um, so I have a shortcut here where I can do git add dash capital A, and this will add all of my files in my current directory into GitHub. But there's one file that I wanted to have excluded, and that was my uh, environmental file that had my username and password. I don't want this to be stored inside of GitHub. So this goes back to that one of the very first files that we had created called the git ignore file. And you can see when GitHub created this file, they created all kinds of things uh, that are kind of the defaults. 
I'm just going to go ahead to the very top and let's go ahead and insert another file to have excluded. Let's see here. So coming back up to the top of the file and I'm going to just going to type in .env. That's my uh, environmental file that has my username and password. I want to exclude Git from ever looking at that. Now that we've updated the git ignore file to include the .env, we'll go ahead and run that kind of wildcard of git add dash capital A for all files. Now we need to add a message. You will get very comfortable with this workflow. Add any files that have changed, add a, a create a commit operation with a message. And we're gonna say in this case, uh, store backup files. All right, and now we're gonna say get push and I'm expecting to get a message come back that says you're, you're looking to push to a branch that doesn't currently exist in GitHub and which it does. And so it prevents us, it, it presents us with the message. Let me copy and paste it right here. Okay, and what we can see is that we have uh, five files have changed. Uh, we've created uh, the backups file, the poetry and the lock. And now we have successfully pushed that up into the GitHub branch. So any other teammate that's working on this will now get a banner message to say, hey, look, there's been a new branch and there's been some changes inside of there. So let's go ahead and click on the compare and pull request. And let's look at these changes that are being made. So one, I can see the user on this. In this case, it, it, it was uh, set to myself. I can see any changes. And so on the git ignore file, the only change that we made is we told it to ignore our local inf file. So really good. Um, here in the backups, we can see all the configuration that was downloaded from the device for virtual SRX one. You also see it for virtual SRX two. And I think that's gonna be, oh, we got the, the poetry lock and the Tomal file. So I told you that when poetry runs, it's gonna create two different files. One in this case is the Tomal file, which just lists the version of Python that I'm using and any packages that I'm using. There's also a poetry lock file. Let me just go ahead and show you. It's gonna have all the specific metadata regarding all of the packages that we're, we're running. Honestly, you don't need to add the lock file. Um, this will automatically be created whether or not you do it yourself. The only one that you would really only need to keep a consistent working environment is this project uh, Tomal file right here. Okay, so uh, these changes look good. We're just gonna go ahead and sign off on them. Uh, let's say, looks, it's me and we'll go ahead and create that pull request again we're only making changes in this construct of a branch once we review those changes then we say yes or no as to actually moving them into the production branch i'll go ahead and say yes and so now we will successfully merge that and i can now successfully delete the uh, the temporary branch that we were working from this, this is the workflow that you will find yourself executing quite a bit when you work inside of a team construct. Personally, I should be doing this, but I don't because I, I just work by myself. So I don't really have anyone to ever review or audit my code. So I typically just do everything in the main branch, but please don't be like me. Please follow best practices, create branches, check them out, review them with your teammates and and such. Uh, just my situation is a little bit more unique. Um, okay, and now what's really great about this is that what we've been showcasing is that we've been making changes to this project as we go along, right? We've been adding files, we've been uh, making changes to files as such, but you know, what's really incredible about Git is that it has this construct of, of providing an audit log for you. So here I can see that this project, my first Python project, has a total of seven times we've committed some kind of change to, uh, to the project. Let's go ahead and open that up. And what we can do is we can actually do kind of like a John Madden play-by-play -play exactly. You started here, now you're here. What were all the things that changed uh, throughout that? And you can also go back in time to that specific commit uh, within the project's history and restore something. If, if somebody had submitted some code and it broke, 
and uh, you needed to quickly revert, this is going to be your get out of jail free card. The ability to automatically roll the project back to a specific commit is highly advantageous uh, when you're working with complex automation for sure. All right. So going back to the, the PowerPoint here, we talk about poetry, we talk about the workflow, the goal is to create a dedicated virtual environment for all of your Python packages for this specific project. You initialize the wizard, you walk through the wizard, you declare your dependencies or not, uh, you install any packages that you declared in that wizard through the poetry install. Anything else later on that you say, oh man, I forgot about you know adding invoke. Well, then you, the operation would be just a poetry add and then the name of the package. It'll automatically update the TOML file so that everyone else will be on the same page as you. And when you're ready to enter into the Python virtual environment with all of your nice shiny packages, use a poetry shell operation for that. And if you wanna leave your virtual environment, you do a poetry exit. So this is great, but how do I get even better than this? Well, the option would be to use Docker. Now we touched a little bit last session on Docker, and but we, we focused on like the context of how Docker can be used to build out virtual lab environments, virtual networking devices, how to connect devices, build BGP with them and all those sorts of things. This time we're gonna be using Docker to create a perfect little isolated environment that everybody can run everywhere uh, and have no fear of any types of dependency packages issues or, or, or anything along those lines. Uh, so not getting too deep into Docker, let me just show you really quick. Docker, in, well, when I say Docker, what I really mean is containers. Docker is a company. Um, they're highly revered for being one of the, the companies that helped kind of create an easy on-ramp into the container world. Um, so just know when I say Docker, I really mean containers. Um, there is a big difference between containerization and virtualization. This probably isn't the right place or session to have these conversations. We touched a little upon it last time, but at the end of the day, what you do with Docker is you create a, an image, you create a, 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 a virtualization environment um, and you, you kind of snapshot it as this image. Uh, and then you add any different files and dependencies that you want into this Docker image. And then every time that you want to run your automation, you just summon that image and then you tell it what you want it to go do. So in this case with Docker, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a Docker file, which is gonna allow us to uh, create the instructions needed for Docker to build the image to our specification. And the way that we actually build that container image after we have a Docker file is we type in Docker build and point to the path of that directory. In this case, it'll be in our local directory. So it'll be just a dot. Now, uh, when you want to run your container image, you would use a Docker run command followed by a series of different flags. Uh, and that will actually run your Docker container image. If your Docker uh, container was to stop, you can restart it with a Docker start command. Um, or if you want to just shut down a running container, you can do a Docker stop in the name of the container. Or if you're just looking to check the status of your currently running Docker uh, containers, you can do a Docker PS. Docker is, again, it's a really deep conversation. It's an entire career, it honestly is. Um, but uh, these containers are the foundation for modern application architecture. When you hear things like Kubernetes, it's exactly what we're talking about, except that's more of a management construct um, around Docker containers. So in our case, we're gonna take our Python script and then we're gonna include it inside of a Docker image and that's how we're going to be executing our Python environments. That gets us away from ever having to worry about Python dependencies or anything along those lines. Uh, Brian asks, can you touch Docker run versus Docker compose? Yeah, absolutely. So Docker itself, again, is a, it's a command line tool that um, allows you to build containers, run containers, stop containers, remove containers, right? That's the construct behind Docker. Your container itself is 
or it should be laser focused on one specific task. When you start to hear other parts of uh, organizations talk about microservices, that's kind of what they're talking about doing is taking an application that's got all these different components and breaking it into individual containers. And believe it or not, <laughs> managing containers is pretty difficult. Uh, it gets unwieldy very, very quickly, especially when your application has like a container for the database, a container for the web app, the container for the load balancer, a container for this, container for that. It's very, very difficult to manage all these things because you'll be firing off Docker commands all day and all night. So enter Docker Compose, and we won't be touching upon this. It's a, we should probably do a dedicated session, but what Docker Compose will do is it allows you to write a YAML file that tells the intent of what you would like your containers or how you like your containers to run. You can tell a Docker Compose, hey, I want this container to always uh, restart. If it crashes, just go ahead and restart it so it's always up. Or you can say, hey, build a virtual network between this container and this container so that they, they can talk to each other. Or, or maybe pass environments into these different containers. It's basically a, a, a management tool to help you manage the life cycle of your containers. Uh, very, very cool tool. All right, so for us, let me clear the screen. Let's take a look at our project again here. We have our Python script, that's app.py. We've got some backup files, we, so we know that our, the script's running. Uh, the license just came with our GitHub project. Um, Poetry lock and pyproject.toml. Those are my packages dependencies that we had created through the poetry tool. And then the readme file is just the, that clear text file. Um, there's also a, a couple of hidden things here. One is the env file where it's got our username and passwords. Uh, the git ignore is a, a text file with a bunch of uh, files and directories to never include inside of Git. So that way our repository stays nice and clean and lightweight. Uh, and then there's another directory uh, dedicated just for all Git operations. We edited this earlier when we changed HTTP to SSH, we had to modify the Git config so that it will use the SSH transport. All right, so there we go. Let's go ahead and I'm gonna copy in a Docker file that I created this morning uh, because I don't really feel like building these live is, is the most enjoyable experience. So we'll say my first, there we go, and say Docker file, and I'll copy it to my local directory. Now, when I do my tree, I now see that I have a file here called Docker file. Docker is expecting a file called Docker file. Uh, so if you named it anything else, like, um, um, like Wu-Tang Clan, for instance, instead, uh, you would have to tell Docker when you run your commands where to find the Docker file. By default, it's gonna look for something called Docker file. So uh, if I wanted to build this Docker container, I would say docker.build and then pass in the path. In this case, it's gonna be my local working directory. So I'll hit the dot here. So what this is gonna do is this is going to, um, actually, you know what? Yeah, this is gonna go ahead and build out my Docker environment. Uh, while that is running, let me see if I can't actually uh, take a peek at that Docker file real quick while this is going. C dot at code one, and we'll try to do my first Docker file. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a peek at this Docker file as it's actually being built in the background here. So what we can see, actually I'll use Vim because it gets me pretty colors. Yeah. All right, uh, so the, here's a list of instructions for my container image. The very top, I'm telling it what I would like my Docker container to be based upon. Now there's a, a resource called Docker Hub where companies will publish all of their container images for you. Uh, I looked at this morning and I said, I just searched for the official Python repository and I wanted something that was running Python 3.8 and something that was running on Debian Linux. So Bullseye was the selection for me. Um, and that's how, I, that's how I derived right here. But this just tells Docker, all right, we're starting from somewhere. We're starting with the base Python package that's based on Python.3 
and Ubuntu or Debian. Then I add a little bit of metadata, just different things about the container that, that I would recognize and help me. This does not impact the build. This is just helping the future Calvin understand what it was that I was trying to do here. Um, so I'm adding some labels. Now what's kind of interesting is you see that I'm passing in variables into my container based on uh, passing this key value pair. So we call in the env, the environmental. It's a way of creating a variable for your system. And I'm saying I want my poetry version to be 1.1.7. And this Python unbuffered thing, this is a, a weird Python caveat when working in containers. So you'll probably always have this set to one. Now, I do some basic installation. I do a package update for Ubuntu, and then I install a package called GCC. It allows me to compile things. Uh, and here's where we go ahead and we install our poetry. Here you can see I'm referencing the, the variable that we had created up here. So this command right here, run pip poetry, uh, and it'll pull down the variable. It'll say uh, equals 1.1.7. So I know I get the exact version of poetry inside of my container. Um, and so anytime you see the word run prefaced inside of a Docker file, it's basically saying once the container is, 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 uh, is up during the build process, then run this command inside the container. So this is a standard Linux uh, or Ubuntu or Debian type of update and install. If none of this makes sense to you, don't worry. You don't need to. You don't need to be an expert in this case. Um, but uh, after we install Poetry, then I change the working directory to home slash Python inside of my Python container. I copy over that the the two files that we created from our Poetry, which was uh, project. Uh, PyProject.toml and Poetry.lock. I also copy them into the directory that we just changed into inside of the container. I set uh, Poetry to not use virtual environments because Docker is already isolated. There's no benefit to using the virtual environments inside of Docker. So I run this command first. And then I do Poetry install. And I add a couple of flags. I say no interaction, meaning don't prompt me like you would typically with the wizard. Uh, and no ANSI SI. So I forgot what uh, ANSI is supposed to do. I copied it from Stack Overflow. Don't judge me. Uh, and the last thing I do inside of my Python container build process is I copy over our Python script and also put it in the directory of home slash Python. So when this is uh, when this wraps up, what we should see. Let's come over to here. Uh, we should see every single one of those things that we just talked about but as a individual step, right? So the very first step was built from the Python image and then all the label stuff that we did. So every single line that was in a Python or a sign of a Docker file actually translates to a separate step inside of a Docker uh, build. That's really important in the Docker world because if, if the Docker build process has already seen a step before and it creates a, a unique hash for every step. If it's seen that step before, it won't run it again. So this is a way of, uh, of increasing the amount or, or decreasing the amount of build time that's needed. So basically we just built this container image. I wasn't keeping track. Let's just pretend it took uh, a few minutes to, to actually build. If I run this again and I run it again and I run it again, nothing has changed inside of my project, inside of my Docker file. So Docker has already seen all these steps and it won't rerun it again. So very, very helpful to you know, simplify your Docker interactions. Now, if I type in Docker images, I will see that I've got a lot. Uh, oh, heavens, which one are we working from? Um, uh, let's grep out um, Python. Let's clear the screen. Um, I thought I'd create, oh, here's the Python. Okay, my first Python project. Here it is right here. Um, oh, that's not right, it's five hours ago. Okay, so just, just stand by for a second. We'll, we'll get through this. Um, let me go back and say, if I now want to, actually, sorry, let me run this build one more time. I want to make sure. Oh, there's the problem. Okay, sorry. Uh, completely oblivious to this. 
I just built a container image, but I didn't tell it what name to give that image. Really, really important if you're trying to, to, to summon that image in the, in the future. So the way that we do that, we don't call it a name in the container role, we call it a tag. Uh, there's technically two aspects to a container image. There's the name of the image, and that's you can think of that as your project. And then there's a tag, and you can have different versions of tags, just like you have different branches inside of your repository. So in this case, I'm going to pass in a tag, and uh, somebody it said so. Oh, uh, rest in peace, ODB. So we'll do one for this. Uh, we'll call our tag our uh, container image ODB, and I'll just pass in a um, a tag of latest. Okay, so you'll note that although we just created a new Docker image with a new name, when we went through the build process, it was just right down to the end. Again, Docker has already seen all these steps, so it just had them, uh, there was nothing new, so nothing changes. So now if I say Docker images grep for ODB, uh, I can now see I have a Docker image called ODB. It has the tag of latest, and it was created six minutes ago. That was the last time this container image was built and it's coming in at a whopping one gig. All right, so now I want to run ODB, right? So let's say uh, Docker, Docker run ODB and latest, and I'm going to say Python app.py. So what am I saying here? I'm saying Docker, I want to run a Docker image, and then I pass in the name of my image, that is ODB, and then the tag of latest. And then once that image is up and running, I want to pass it a command, and that command is python app.py. So let's go ahead and execute this. And what we can see is that I got a message of, uh, oh, okay, there's a couple of problems here. One that it's expecting me to pass in a PTY to have a live interaction with the container image. Uh, the second one is that uh, we didn't pass in a username or password. Uh, long story short, when you start working with Docker and you start building a lot of these Docker images, you're gonna run into the, a reality really quickly that you're gonna be typing in a lot of Docker commands. So this is gonna be what it's, it's actually gonna be needed to run. I'm gonna say docker run slash IT for interactive terminal. Um, and then I'm gonna say the name of my container, ODB latest python .app.py. So there's all these different types of flags that you're gonna to need to know. IT is really, really important. IT again, stands for interactive uh, terminal, but I think it's actually interactive teletype. I, I don't really remember, but it's basically saying, hey, we're going to run this container and it's going to we, we want to be able to interface with what's actually happening in the background. Now, for our use case, we're just passing in a Python script and we're, we're having it execute. But when you start looking at applications as a whole, you'll start to realize really quick, well, there's a lot of ports that I have to expose. I have to do some port address translation between you know, port 8080 to port 80 or port forward SSH or do all these different things. And all of a sudden your Docker run command becomes a huge, it becomes a real burden for you. But before we figure out a solution for that, let me go ahead and just go ahead and validate this. We'll say virtual SRX one, uh, that's actually going to fail because I do not have DNS working in here. Let's just go ahead and pass the password 105.241 for its IP address. Uh, and we got some uh, authentication errors um, because the Python script did not get the environment variable file that we passed into it, did it? Um, let's validate that. I'm going to run this container again, but instead of running Python app.py, I'm going to ask for the bash terminal. And so let's go ahead and clear the screen. Now I'm actually inside the running container right now. And you can see when we use that work dir in, that, in our Docker file to change your working directory, in our case, we changed it to home Python. This is now the place that we land when we're inside of the container. So I have to do ls-lsa. I can see that my environment file, the .env, was not included inside of here. So that's obviously going to be an issue for us. Let's go back to our Docker file. And I'm also at the end of this file. Let's copy and paste. 
Let's also copy over our dot env into the same directory. And now that we've made changes to our Docker image, now we have to go through the build process again. So I'm gonna say Docker build dash tag ODB latest and hit dot. And the execution should just take a second longer and it did. And so now we should probably be a little bit more successful when we run our script because our inf file is in there. And let's type in the IP address 105.241. And okay, there we go. We see that it backed up the configuration. If I did a tree here, oh, that's the problem. I did the, did the backup inside of the container, which is not what we wanted. So at the end of the day, there's a lot of challenges that you have to kind of work around working with Docker because it is this like dedicated safe space that runs just for a limited time and then it goes away. So instead of using that, let's do this. I'm gonna bring in a new tool into the conversation by returning to PowerPoint here. Let's see, uh, additional tools to simplify our life. So the one that I wanted to talk about, we've already talked about python.env, uh, again, the ability to put secrets and passwords and variables uh, in a text file, and then they'll automatically appear inside of your scripts. Uh, but I wanna do something else. I wanna use this Python package that we installed called invoke. So you can look at Invoke uh, as a way to create your own CLI. And don't believe me on that. That's not exactly what I mean. But basically, you can write a Python script and you can say, whenever I type in this command, I want you to do this, right? And that this can be really, really long and complex. This will definitely make your interaction with your development in your Python scripts are significantly easier, especially when you're running it in containers. Because again, the, the, um, the, the commands can get really, really difficult to remember. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and use a shortcut here. Calvin R, I'll go to networking automation examples. On and my first Python project. And I wanna copy over a file called tasks.py. I'm gonna move it to my local directory. Now let's take a peek at this tasks.py. Now this is Python. So if you don't feel comfortable and you don't understand it, it's okay. Just understand what we're doing is we're importing the invoke uh, package into this Python script. And from here, uh, we can build basically our own CLI commands that we would want to run. So uh, similar to what we had shown before, uh, I can pass an environmental variable, I can create variables. In this case, I'm creating a variable called Docker image and one called Docker tag. Um, and let's go ahead and update these if you would. Let's go ahead and hit enter. I'm gonna uh, remove that and replace it with ODB. And the Docker tag is going to be called latest. We'll do that. So uh, that's only, relevant for this specific file. It's not relevant anywhere else. I'm also creating a uh, another variable called PWD. That's for path working directory. And I'm setting it equal to whatever the working directory is that I'm within. This will be helpful when we start working with containers because I can easily say, hey, I'm in this directory. Go ahead and import all of my files in this directory into my Docker container. Uh, and so here, let's look, I've got three different CLI commands that I've created. One, I've created a CLI file or CLI command called build. Uh, and whenever someone types invoke build, this is what's going to happen. It's going to run docker build dash T for tag, and it's gonna pass in the environmentals that we are the variables that we had created at the beginning of the script, the name of the Docker image and the tag, and then the path to the local directory. So instead of saying docker build dash t odb latest dot, all I now have to do is say invoke build. Now, if I want to jump into that container, rather than saying uh, docker run dash it dash pty dash name of image colon tag bash, whatever, now all I have to do to, to jump into the Linux container, uh, docker container is just type in invoke shell, right? So I've got shell. Uh, and there's another one down here called a script, and this will actually run our Python script within our container, but it also does a couple other things. It'll, 
It'll remove the container. It does all kinds of cool things. All right, so let's exit out of this and let's clear the screen. We'll go through and we'll first try invoke build. And of course it just rebuilt the image. Now, again, I just typed in two words and that was sufficient for the myriad of different options that I was gonna have to do if I did this by hand. Let's also type invoke shell. So just like before, uh, now I'm directly put it into my shell. And if I type in ls-lsa, I can see that we've also added in all of our uh, files that were in our current working directory. We copied them into the container itself. Now, if I type in invoke script, that's mapped into my, uh, the, to actually summon the Docker container um, mount my local working directory inside of the container and also um, run my Python script. In this case, I'm going to say 182.168.105.242. And that will go ahead and back it up. Now, what's really cool about this, uh, the previous time we ran the script within the container, uh, I mentioned that the backup for the container happened inside of the container. And once that container was done with this job, it went away, it died. Uh, it, and so, so there went my backup of the config. But what's interesting is that when I did the invoke uh, for my um, for my task here, if we look at the very bottom, this line that I have selected right here, this one is 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 worth all the money in the world. That dash v says do a volume mount, meaning mount my current directory inside of the container. Uh, and that's where the PWD comes in. Remember at the very top of the script, we said PWD is gonna be equal to my current working directory. So I'm basically mounting my directory as a readable directory inside of my container. So that when my container finishes its job and it writes the file to the directory, whenever the container goes away, I still have that directory. I still have that file just a little bit of magic within working in containers. Now, let's say we, we've done this uh, work, we feel confident. Uh, let's go ahead and check in with what's the status of our project here. Now, from Git's perspective, it says, well, since you last did your push, you, we see that you've made changes to these specific files. Uh, we've created a Docker file, you've created a backup directory with this uh, specific path, and you've also created a tasks.py. And now let's check to see which branch we're currently working on. I think it's going to be main. Uh, add backups, it's not. Uh, is add backups still a thing? Let's come over here. I'm pretty sure I deleted this one. If I refresh my branch, yeah, I just got a single, uh, single one. So what we'll need to do is come back over to our script here and we'll just say git add and I'll say all. So that'll include these three files that haven't been tracked before. We'll say git commit and I'll pass in a message. We'll say uh, include Docker file and tasks.py to simplify our life. And we'll go ahead and do that. And git tells me, it says, okay, we're working in this branch called add backups and you're looking to commit these three files. We'll go ahead and say git push and it'll say, okay, we've gone ahead and done that. On GitHub, we've created a new branch called add backups and it's gonna have these changes that you just did. We come back over to GitHub now and I refresh my page. I should now have two branches. So let's go ahead and look into that. And there's add backups. It was updated 31 seconds ago. Let's go ahead and try a new pull request on that. And we see the message that we had passed in through the command line earlier. And we can see again, green and red, what's been added, what's been deleted. In this case, we added three new files uh, and we look good. That was, that's the backup for one of our firewalls. And there is our Docker container or Docker file. All right, so this uh, looks amazing. Let's go ahead and create that pull request. And this would be the opportunity for me to include somebody else for a peer review. Um, and I'll just go ahead and pretend like I am that person. I'll go ahead and create that pull request and confirm the merge. 
Now it's going to take those three files that we had changed and merge them back into the production branch. And I'll go ahead and, and delete this uh, development branch that we're working on. So if we come back over to our project, we should have a single branch, which we do. We see we now have the backups directory. Uh, we see when we pass an IP address, we changed it into underscores so that uh, Linux directories don't get all upset whenever you put periods inside of the path. Uh, here I can look into the file. Yep, that looks like my config. That's good to go. Uh, so we feel pretty confident that now anyone else in my team can visit this project, pull it down and get off the ground and running either with poetry, creating virtual environments, or just by using the Docker file. Uh, and we used a tasks.py to help with some of those commands so that others can uh, others don't need to know if I want to run your container, it's got to be docker run dash it dash dash rm dash v blah blah blah. No, just get rid of all of that, simplify it down to a single word, uh, and then call that with uh, the, the command of invoke. Really, really helpful way of simplifying the way that you interact with things. So, invoke is a fantastic project. Um, now, I think we're at the yeah, yeah, we're at the, the sketchy part of this presentation. Um, so the question must be asked, is there a way that we can automate the testing of our code, of our Python projects, before we ship it into production? Now, this is a weird one. Uh, and it's a weird one because there's a lot of misconceptions on here. And so this is a topic that we call CICD. So let's talk about what CICD is. Let's talk about what a lot of people have in the networking space that I've run into have misconstrued it to be. Uh, and then let's talk about where it can actually provide benefit for us. So CICD is a, a CICD tool will enable people to help build software and ship it and deploy it into a production environment. Now, this means a lot if you're building a, an application project or an applica piece of software that needs to run on Windows, you need to build an, a .exe file. If you're running it on Mac, you need to build a .pkg file or a, um, a .dmg file or maybe an ISO. Or if you're packaging it for Linux or Ubuntu, you got to create a, a .deb file or a yum file on, on uh, Red Hat Linux. Where I'm getting at with this is that traditional software developers, they have to they, they take their source code and then they have to run it through a compiler and then they actually get a, uh, they export the result into different packages for different operating systems. And then they have to run those packages on all different types of software versions and operating systems. And it gets to be a really, really, really difficult and extremely time consuming process to do. So what CICD does and tools that uh, play in this space, what they do is they allow you to create this concept of a pipeline where you can have a state where you can create these different stages uh, that will help perform a specific task within that build and deploy uh, pipeline process. So they typically are like uh, there's a build a process where you know where we take in all the code and we run it through a compiler and then we get this specific package and then we'll run it through a series of tests right we'll test it on mac os big sur and then we'll test it on mac os catalina and then we'll test it on mac os snow leopard or whatever the version and then we'll do the same for all the flavors of linux and we'll do the same for all the versions of windows and then once we go through and all those tests are passed We'll go into a uh, deploy stage where we'll actually package it uh, accordingly, put it in the right part repository for people to download. Uh, and then there, there's typically a validation phase as well where we can run unit tests across that code. So here's the problem, right? And on network automation for the vast majority is going to be Python based almost exclusively. And this is coming from someone who really loves to use JavaScript. The reality is that Python is King Kong in this space and it will continue to be for a long while. Python um, does not need to be compiled 
And I'm saying that with an asterisk because there actually is a small compilation um, that you will never see. You don't interact. It just happens by itself. But there's no files for us to assemble like Voltron and then perform all these different types of tests. Additionally, when we look at CICD and pipelines, the idea is how we help automate the testing of this code. We want to make sure this code is legit before it goes out there. The problem that we have in the networking space is that most of the CICD tools are SaaS based solutions. So let me ask you a simple question. How is a SaaS based solution going to build an SSH tunnel to 10.10.10.1? It's not going to have that route. There's no way, right? So we can build all this automation and it can be just so rock solid. But if the CI CD tool lives in the public cloud, then there's no way for that automation tool to actually run the code and perform a successful uh, or um, unsuccessful operation. So CI CD. There is applicability, but it really comes down to what is it that your project is trying to do? Are you building a web application like in, in Python Django, excuse me, or Python Flask? Yeah, CI CD makes a lot of sense because that will stand up a web server. It'll be listening on port 8080. Then you can do a curl command, make sure that it get a response. But for those of us that are building automation to talk to networking devices, the routing thing right off the bat is almost a deal breaker for many. But like I said at the beginning of this, when we talked about GitLab and GitHub, there are options to run GitHub and GitLab inside of your own corporate IT. And honestly, I'd be amazed if there weren't half a dozen versions of GitLab running in your organization already. A bunch of shadow IT work going on, believe me. Almost every company I've been in uh, or that I've worked for has got like somebody's running GitLab somewhere. Nobody knows about it. Right. And those types of environments, if you're hosting GitLab or GitHub inside of your organization, well, you fix the routing issue because then the CI CD tool would be able to execute your automation to, to SSH and 10.10.10.1 and prove whether or not it was successful. But the vast majority, again, of all CI CD is typically SaaS based because it's typically meant for real software developers that are building real world applications and they don't have these kind of constraints that we do in the networking space. So again, uh, there, there is use case for it, but it's quite limited on the networking side. That being said, um, and, and oh, sorry, this is kind of a, a real good diagram that I stole from GitLab. Uh, that will kind of show you where CI CD kind of fits into this. So we already are familiar with the branching concept, right? Inside of our Git repository, we have a main production branch. And then we, when we want to make changes, we'll create a new branch. We'll perform all of our code changes inside of that branch. And then CI CD tools will listen in for any types of uh, new branches being created or any pull requests being uh, requested. And whenever those types of triggers are discovered, the CI CD pipeline will then pull up, pull your code into an isolated environment, do whatever task that you tell it to, give you thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not that task was successful. And then it will update the uh, the project back into your uh, mole request and say, hey, this looks pretty good. Uh, this looks like it passed our, our auditing, so it should be ready for merging into production. That way, anyone that's reviewing your proposed changes has a high level of confidence that, yeah, yeah, the, the CI CD works, so the, the actual automation should also work. Although that, again, like I said, that's kind of a, a big uh, step. Once they review and, and approve it, like we saw, we merge back into the production branch. And then there's this construct of continuous development, which uh, again, repeats the process over and over. CI CD can mean a couple of different things. Continuous integration, like what we're talking about here. Continuous deployment, which really helps with the deployment of real software. I'm saying our automation is not really real software, uh, but don't take offense to that. Um, it's, it's just a completely different construct here. Uh, but the deployment for people that are building um, .package files or .yum files, or those are really important. That's where the deployment comes in. There's also a continual development. 
which will sometimes be replaced with continual uh, um, deployment, development, deployment. People call CICD things, different things all the time. Now, before I give you some examples and we'll, we'll showcase some CICD here, let me just point out something that I think is a real common misconception. People see these types of automated pipelines and they think, you know, I really want that for my network automation. I want to have a series of steps that we execute in a serial fashion. Uh, and I, that's how I want my automation executed, right? That is not what we would call CICD. That's what we would call workflow orchestration. And that's one thing that Ansible does really, really well, right? You, you write your first task at the top, you write your second task at the bottom and so on and so forth. And Ansible will execute it in a, a, a series of, of workflow events. Now, um, stepping outside of the Ansible construct, workflow orchestration is incredibly powerful for network automation. There's a lot of things that we would like to do when we're, we're building our automation. Maybe we want to phone home to our network source of truth and get a list of devices. And once we have those list of devices, then we wanna then we wanna log in and change all the SNMP credentials. And then when we're done with that, then we wanna send a message to Slack to let everyone know that we were successful. That's a workflow, right? That's certain sequences and certain events happening in a specific string or a specific order of operations, uh, but they're doing different aspects of it. CICD is kind of like that in the way that they've divvied up their, their, their different stages, but try your best to not confuse the two because it's, it's very easy to think CICD is doing workflow. I want workflow, so I need CICD. Eh, you probably don't. You probably don't at the end of the day. But let's go ahead and give you some examples of this. So back up in here, we have a dedicated uh, actions section inside of GitHub. Actions is uh, the CI/CD uh, mechanism inside of GitHub. It's actually relatively new on the block. Uh, believe it or not, GitHub actually did not have a CI/CD before. It would rely on you, the customer, to either bring something like Jenkins to the table, or Travis, or Bamboo, or Circle CI, or any of the other hundreds of different CI/CD tools out there. Uh, in contrast, GitLab has CI CD built in from the uh, from the get go. It's one of the reasons why I use GitLab because holy moly, it's super simple to use. It's really excellent. But in our case, we're just going to stick with GitHub since that's what we have. Uh, GitHub is giving me some some recommendations on some things that we can do here. I'm not going to use these. I had something pre canned already. So let's go ahead and pull that into our directory here. So uh, what I need to do first for GitHub to find out where my CI CD pipeline is, I need to create a file uh, in a very specific directory. So I'm gonna say make directory uh, dot GitHub, the dot meaning that it'll be by default a hidden directory, and then another one called workflows. And now that that's here, again, if we do a tree, uh, I, I won't see it because it's hidden, but if I did an ls-lsa, I'll see now I have a directory called GitHub and inside of there will be my workflows directory, dot GitHub. Okay, and there's the workflows directory. All right, so now I'm gonna copy over a, um, a, a test file that I had for CI CD. Uh, let's go ahead and move into my directory with all my examples networking automation examples python my first dot github workflows the name of my workflow and i'm going to move it into the directory called github and workflows boom okay so pretty uh pretty gnarly command that i just had to run but now if i was to take a peek let's go ahead and edit that workflows file and see what it looks like here uh, so GitHub Actions Demo, right? So here, again, very, very simple YAML uh, formatting for our job. We give it a name. Uh, we say when we want this to run. So on, on a push, on a commit, on both, on a pull, how do you want to trigger this CI CD pipeline? Once you've uh, and created that trigger, then you tell it what you want it to do. In this case, I want this 
these sequence of events to take place on a Ubuntu image and go ahead and use the latest Ubuntu image. That's what we're saying right here. And here's all the steps that we want to have executed. In this case, I'm just printing out to the screen a bunch of different emojis and a bunch of different texts. And we can also see that some environment variables from GitHub are also being passed into here. And so this really isn't going to do a whole lot other than go through a pipeline and print a bunch of output to the screen. But if you were doing a, a, like a real software development, this is where you do your compilations. This is where you would introduce your unit tests. Uh, this is where you would do all of the fancy things to make sure that your code is packaged correctly, it's deployed correctly, it's validated, and it's shipped out just like you expected. All right. So what do we do? We've added a new file. How do we get that back into Git? Well, the first thing for me to do is say uh, Git branch to figure out where I'm at. I'm still on that add backups. And I know for a fact that GitHub, we deleted that branch. So let's go ahead and create a new branch. I'm gonna call git checkout dash B for branch. And I'm gonna call this one, uh, we'll call it CICD. There we go. And so we've created a new local branch and we've checked it out, right? And so now if I say get status, um, I can see that I've got one directory that we have not included inside of our project. So let's go ahead and run get that add dash capital A that'll include all the things, get commit and add our message as into um, introduce CI CD into our project. And then we do a git push. It'll alert me. It says, hey, you're trying to you're trying to push your changes to a branch that doesn't exist on GitHub. Here's the, the command that you need to run. I'll go ahead and do that. And it's gone ahead and pushed it up into the GitHub branch. Now, this is going to be what's pretty interesting for me because I've never seen this happen before, never seen this uh, because I don't use GitHub very often. Let's go ahead and look into this uh, compare and pull request. And now let's say, okay, that looks good. So we'll say, looking real sharp there. All right, go ahead and create that pull request. Now what should happen is that we should have a, oh, well, I expected a uh, the CICD to actually instantiate. Let's see if it did, it did. It did, it just, it happened way faster than we were expecting. So we haven't merged our changes yet into the production branch. However, whenever we did a pull request, that kicked off the CI CD pipe, uh, pipeline. And if we look into the checks part of our pull request, we can see exactly what took place. And so I got all these different steps here within my, uh, my project, just like we declared inside of our file. Here we, uh, we set up the job, there's a bunch of environment variables that GitHub will set into it. Uh, here we just print out some echoes, check out the repository, but all these are happening in a sequential order. If you had a hosted version of CICD in your environment, like a GitHub Enterprise or GitLab, you could very well have included a step in here to SSH into or run your Python script inside of that Docker container that we had built and then um, save the file and that would be your test. If it, everything came out good, then GitHub will give you a, a thumbs up. Now, before we, we go ahead and commit this, I just wanna uh, show this. GitHub will tell you, it says all checks have passed, meaning inside of your CI CD pipeline, we have successfully tested all of those things that you were looking for and we did it in four seconds. We'll go ahead and click merge pull request and that should go ahead and now incorporate the CI CD pipeline uh, into our main branch. So now, anytime somebody pulls down this project and starts to, to go to town on it, we now know as soon as they uh, submit their pull request, this workflow that we just built out, this pipeline, will automatically go through and perform whatever tasks were declared. Again, in the automation network automation space, this if you're using SAS, it's going to be limited applicability. Maybe you just have it build your container image just to make sure your container image works, right? That's a really good use case for uh, for one round of the brigade. But uh, hopefully that has been uh, beneficial for you. Let me see. I 
think we're at the time. We're just a couple of minutes over. So with that, um, I, I just want to revisit kind of what we what we incorporated today because holy, it was a lot. Um, what we showcase today is one, how to safely store your projects in a remote uh, environment. In this case, we're using services like GitLab and GitHub to, to hold the, the actual source code as we're working on the project. We talked about branching a lot. It's a really big concept. Uh, it requires, honestly, a dedicated session just for itself. But we showcased how you can use the construct of branching to work inside of a collaborative environment with other teammates and not conflict with each other. Uh, we talked about the reality when you work in Python, you're working with a lot of external packages and dependencies. And anyone else that pulls down your project right out of the gate is not going to have an environment that looks like yours. So we provided two different mechanisms to draw, uh, address that. One, we use poetry to create Python virtual environments, and then that creates the file that we can check into GitHub. Or you can build Docker images, uh, which would make a really compact uh, Docker image that anyone can pull down at any given time and execute successfully with 100% your environment within that container image. We talked about invoke, uh, the ability to basically create CLI commands um, by uh, creating a Python file called tasks.py and then just dumping whatever CLI commands you want inside of that file. Uh, we also talked about python.env, which allows you to store your secrets or whatever variables you want in a local environment file. Uh, and then pull those variables into your Python script whenever you run. And we talked a little bit about CICD and what its actual function in the world is and whether or not it has applicability into the networking space. All right, uh, so we're five minutes over, but let's go ahead and open this up and see if anyone's got any questions for us. Uh, let's see. Give Calvin his flowers. Brian, what's that about, man? Uh, don't, know what you, don't know what you're indicating there, man. Um, but yeah, I, I will accept sunflowers. That's, that's wonderful. Um, all right. I don't know if anyone... Um, so Jason asked, any thoughts on Git EA? I don't know what that is. Um, I don't uh let's let's do a google i'm gonna pretend like you're not mistyping it but let's see what this is hey calvin it's jason oh jason hey yeah hey so git t is like a open source board software package uh, it's a lightweight version of like github and gitlab so i was oh. just had a um thoughts on it because i know a couple of my friends who host this on their you know personal networks because it's way more lightweight than GitLab and GitHub. Yeah, I, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm saying that without me doing any due diligence, by the way, but um, I uh, listen, <laughs> I've run GitLab inside of my home environment for a couple of years. And um, as much as I like the project, it's really heavy. It's really, really heavy. And I'm imagining that GitHub is in the same position. Um, they are both extensively heavy applications, uh, and when they go bad, things can get out of control really quickly. So I'm, I'm all about uh, testing out other alternatives, and this one, if it's as you uh, have suggested here, um, I mean, just looking at the sponsors, if, if these people are actually using it, then it kind of speaks to um, the credit for it. I know all of these people, and they're all amazing. Um, yeah. On our, um, cause we have a, or in my environment, we're on a closed network. We have GitLab, but we also host a uh, Git T in our, within the environment for various reasons, but more so because it's super lightweight and uh, especially with uh, authentication stuff, we don't have to really worry about it. Oh, uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing this. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really interested in it. Um, I would say roughly 99% of the projects that I build and work on, I don't, I, they're not public. I don't share them with anyone. Uh, not because I don't like you guys, just because it's just stuff that I'm, I'm kicking the tires with and not really needing um, 
uh, public access. So this is 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 actually really really intriguing to me. Um, I'm imagining that you would be able to incorporate like a CI/CD tool if you went down that path. Like I, I'm thinking, like if I'm hosting it, then it has access to my internal network. So there might be some CI/CD that I want to do. But I'm imagining if this is as lightweight as it says, then it probably doesn't have that type of functionality, which is honestly, it's fine by me. Yeah, so not to go into all the details and, and whatnot, but within our environment, we have a GitLab and then we set up our own Git T and then we're cloning repos from GitLab that we want. And then we're just hitting Git T and as opposed to GitLab and we don't have to worry about authentication. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. It totally makes sense. I love to hear stories like this because it's uh, it, it shows like the um, ingenuity of people kind of like working around, um, you know, complex systems. So really cool story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in giving this a shot. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, Brian, it means give you praise for the great session. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, my first session was wonderful. Oh, thanks, Abby. That's really kind. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see uh, the jump, but thanks for the great session. Yeah. Uh, so again, everyone will will go ahead and, and conclude this one. Um, I will upload the uh, the session up to to YouTube. Um, uh, all of our past sessions are up there. Uh, if you have any suggestions or anything that you're interested in learning, um, please feel free to, to send me an email or, or shout my way. Um, I, I'm open to suggestions. If you want to learn more about Docker, if you want to learn more about Git, or if you want to just get back to writing Python or Ansible, uh, please just let me know. I'm open to any suggestions. Um, with that being said, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate it, uh, your participation today. Kate's, oh no, oh, Jason wants Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is one of my favorite products and oh my goodness, is it complicated. <laughs> it's amazing, but it's so difficult. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see if we can't do an introduction course or at least a comparison between Kubernetes and some of the other products out there. Like a personal favorite of mine is HashiCore's Nomad uh, or Docker Compose, that's another version uh, kind of, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, thanks, everybody. We'll go ahead and put this up to the YouTube and we'll see you guys next month. Thanks so much. Have a good one.